All right, introductions aren't really a thing we do here on Back Chat, so we just get straight into it. We are joined by the great man himself, Brad Shepard. Um, he's played over 200 games of AFL footy. Not, not many goals, I will say that. We'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, all Australian, <laughs> straight away. Um, best clubman at West Coast, uh, player of a final series. He's done a lot on the AFL field, and he joins us now on Back Chat. G'day, Shepo. Thanks for having me. How Shep. are you, mate? Going well. Just recovered from a week in ISO through the COVID. Oh, but, boy. Um, Great to be here. My first commitment out of out of the isolation, so no better way to do so. Now we do thank you for coming in. So we do we do one question off the top that we've left out of the rundown again, Dan. But I have remembered it what was we in do. There. I saw it. I missed it. It's the first question we ask every guest. Right? We know you've done a lot of things on the footy field. I just touched on a few, and we'll touch on some more going forward. But we do like to ask our guests. Footy's great, but. What's the greatest sporting achievement you've ever had or ever done or greatest sporting feat not on the football field? I know you're a master of many talents. I know, yes. I know you taught yourself up as a cricketer. You <laughs> Wait, it's a long list. Golf. <laughs> like, he, he's okay. a good golfer. I actually, yes, he's yes. Straight I'll, to I'll, it. I'll, I'll, I've got one straight oh, away. So, yeah. Give people a bit of time to think about it. But Yeah, I've got one straight away. It's come to mind. So, you know, I won't put cricket in there as well because there, there's a Thank couple you. of cricketers. I'll, I'll, cricket memories and stories there. Yes. But... There's probably one at the age of 13 years of age Perfect. playing in a golf tournament, um, uh, male and female, at Collier Park. And my cousin Mitch, he was playing in it as well. And um, there's only about, I reckon, 10 kids in this whole golf tournament. Was it a um, kids tournament or was it an open tournament? Yeah, it was open up, up to the age of 13. I reckon most people there were the age of 13. That's anyway. Like 25 year old just being <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, yes, yeah, 25 year old. Um, anyway. So throughout the, throughout the course of the day, having a stink around, had, had a good last two holes, which somehow come, come out of the clouds and, and won this tournament. Yes. And to receive the award, you had to get up on stage and in front of all the, all the kids, all the families, the parents there, and receive, which I got a putter at the time. And um, as I got up on stage, the bloke who was presenting me with the award said, I'd like to thank everyone to come out to, to support and watch, watch all the kids and yes. participants today and he handed over me the microphone but i thought he said say what i said so i grabbed i grabbed the the golf putter and i said oh first of all i'd like to thank everyone for coming out and watch me today it means a lot <laughs> as 13 and then walked off the straight walked off the stage didn't say anything else and everyone was like shocked laughing is, it, is he joking or is this real <laughs> so that's a story. There you go. And so I've still got that putter. So what does that make you? The under 13 Collier Open champion? Yes, I think so. I, I okay. really love how Shep's attacked it off the top. <laughs> I mean, some people, that, well, I can see in their eyes, they don't know where to go with it. They're like, yeah, oh, I don't know what I shot. I was, I was a footy player. That's my yeah. entire personality. I the think it shocked me most was the putter was worth $30 <laughs> and the second prize was a $60 golf box voucher. So, <laughs> so like, I don't know if winning was a great thing. Uh, I, I think I'm most good. impressed that there was like a bunch of family members to watch 13 year olds play golf. Like, <laughs> my mum was a caddy actually. <laughs> oh, Ray yeah, Lane. Ray Lane was a caddy. Really? Yep. So, um, she was there for support. Okay, very good. She's been <laughs> I there. Probably should have thanked her straight there's, away. She's been there from a very early age, Raylene, supporting <laughs> you. So that's good. So you mentioned your cousin Mitch. So for those who have been hiding under a hole, your cousins Mitch and Sean Marsh, Australian cricketers. Was cricket ever an option for Bradley Shepherd? I'd like to think so. You played state state uh, under seventeens for Western Australia. Yes, I played state seventeens and uh, was in the state nineteen squad um, as a sixteen year old, but chose to uh, play. Football, I do a pre-season each round, but yeah, cricket was always a passion of mine. It was always obviously in the family, and it's probably, probably played as a as a junior more cricket than football. And I always thought if I was ever going to play a professional sport, cricket was always going to be the way. Um, but so be it. You know, I went down the footy path. Probably at a, that age, a lot better in footy than I was at cricket. Albeit, you sort of cricketers, you don't know, you don't really develop till your mid twenties. I feel so yeah. it's sort of a bit of the unknown, but yeah. Who knows, mate? Could have been, could have been for, for WA. Well, We've been good playing for WA this year with well, the success. Let's just think about it. So, so you grew up around Mitch and Sean, right? So you, you play backyard cricket, I'm assuming. Yep. Oh, could, could, would you say okay. you can match it with them? Or? Yeah, well, I used to have the mental edge over Mitch. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, he was my bunny. I, I was a bowling all-rounder. So uh, when we used to play against Sean, Sean was a batter and we used to bowl to him uh, days on end. And if he ever got out, which he never did, he would just walk off and storm off. So we were just happy to be because he's eight years old. Uh, Elder than what Mitch and I are, so yeah, same age. You're yeah, Mitch. Mitch and I are the same age. So we would bowl to Sean, and then when it was Mitch and myself, yeah, it'd be highly competitive out in the tennis court. And they had a, uh, actually a bowling machine cricket net at their property in Jandicott. So you can imagine 
uh, young good. kids coming in. We used to always get the, the bowling machine on about 140, 145 clicks <laughs> with a tennis ball. So it would come out rapid, hit the pitch, and then slow up so much that you just bamboozle <laughs> you. moving everywhere as <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Would have been like facing Dan Constant under 12. Um, yeah. Where did you play? Old Leggies. Cool Chew- 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 Hill Cricket Club. Yes. You gotta, yeah, there you go. Chew- Hill Lines. Oh. Yeah. I mean, if you got to bring it up, I mean, there is the, my, my trophy there from bowling five wickets for 12. Um, no, five for 16 in oh, a grand, in a grand, grand final. final. And wow. that's the ball. Yeah, they saved oh, the ball, made a trophy out of it. Congratulations. And they lost. Five yeah, for 16, lost. they lost. Yeah, I think <laughs> I just cleaned up the tail. But it um, doesn't matter. Did what I did what I had to do. Uh, do, you, do you ever think about uh, – I, I know you played footy and you would have earned good money, but, but cricketers with the IPL coming in started to earn some pretty decent money. You know, your cousin's a, a couple, a part of that. Do you ever think about – what it would have been like if you had it gone down the cricket path? Um, probably more like so. All, all jokes aside. Yeah, right? look, probably more so now. I think any kid coming through the system, you probably err on the side of if you've got the talent to potentially play professional cricket, you'll probably go that avenue because there's so many different leagues throughout the world. When I had to make that decision, there was no IPL, there's no 2020 cricket. It was just you play for WA and in your, if you're good enough to be in the, the best 15 cricketers in Australia – yeah. To play for Australia, yeah, the incentives there. But to get to that stage, it was, it was quite hard as yeah. opposed to footy as 18-year-olds. You can pretty much make an impact, make a living then and there. So, yeah, um, yeah we'll probably oh, I can't say it would be a different decision, but it would probably have – I'd have more thought into it because I knew that if I went down the cricketing path, I was going to make it as an 18, 19-year-old. It's probably more long-term prospect. Mm. Not everyone has a bowling machine in their backyard. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's elite. Yeah, no. Yeah. no wonder I didn't make it. I didn't oh. have the gear. Uh, there was a couple of other reasons you didn't make it. <laughs> right, so um, a big topic at the moment at West Coast is the lack of, of talent that is coming through the club. I, I think it is anyway. Lack of top 10 draft picks, uh, lack of junior talent. Um, there seems to be a void of that. But you were one of a top 10 Draft eight back in the day, number back seven. Pocket. Yes, number back seven. Back pocket. So you say you drafted as a back pocket, but oh, you start your career as a forward, mate. Yeah, I think I think a midfielder initially. I think they thought they were picking up Chris Judd or <laughs> trying try to pick up Chris Judd, but how far from the truth that was. Well, so okay, so you get drafted top ten. So high end talent, and I look back to that time. What, what you, you two thousand nine? You get drafted. Yep. So two thousand ten, we win the wooden spoon. So thanks for bringing that along. I um, <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> but but. I do look at that time, right, and so people are comparing it, I think, a bit. West Coast are going to go close to being one of the worst sides in the competition this year. But you look at that period and, and you have a Brad Shepard added to the list. You have Andrew Gaff, Jack Darling, Nick Nananui, Luke Shuey, Shannon Hearn, Josh Kennedy, Will Schofield. Uh, you have, uh, you know, Eric McKenzie. You've you got a big list of high-end talent that I think maybe back at the time you could see the high-end talent, which is lacking now. But coming in as a top-10 draft pick, um, is there any pressure? Do you, you know, you do start getting played as a forward sort of consistently at that period of time. What's the mindset when you come into the club? Yeah, well, I, I actually debuted round seven in my first year, which is, um, you know, it's pretty early on for a, a draftee. And yeah. I probably would have never been in that position if the club wasn't where it was at that time. You know, it was lost a few games early and I think with the injury list we had at that time uh, there was a lot of pressure externally to play the kids and luckily enough I was one of those kids coming through so uh, I think my first game it was against Hawthorne at home and my first uh, first uh, bit of play on the ground was in a centre bounce so I started my first ever um, taste of AFL level was in the centre bounce did you? yeah so can that's, you remember um, who was in there with you? Uh, who was it? I reckon Scott Selwood would have been there yeah. uh, Luke Shuey Nick Nat, and I can myself. I don't right. know how. I, I think I started on the bench, so <laughs> someone would have come off for me to come on. But um, Go to? Yeah, I was. I, I, was, I, I was trying to call the shots in my first game. <laughs> but in, in the in the build-up to that, I was playing for East Shemaine, and I was playing uh, in, in the midfield itself and then resting at um, half-back. So I was sort of rotating between the two. But, um, yeah, that sort of that pressure to play as a high, high draftee and uh, to perform early in your career um, – I, I definitely felt that. And I think externally people expect you to come in and, and make all the difference. And you sort of – well, I, I know for me it took a lot longer than expected, but speaking to everyone around me, they drafted on potential. It wasn't about the then and the, then and now. Mm. Uh, you look at my body shape, you know, you might laugh. It probably didn't change too much in the course <laughs> of my career. I was still, <laughs> still skinny at the end. But just I, I, wasn't, I wasn't mature enough. My body w- didn't really quite handle – AFL football, um, obviously as well, the confidence you need to play at the AFL level. If you're not playing 
uh, your best every week and as a junior and, and at waffle level you know you build up that barrier of confidence because you you know you've done the work you know you're, you're starring every week and then you go to a level that you've never been to before and you just think it's going to roll on you're going to star every week but when it doesn't just coping with that uh feeling that how, how do you where do you go to next because you, you always been at the top when you're you're on the list, I know as an early draft pick, you're probably number 46 on the list when you first come into a footy club and accepting where you're at. It took me definitely a couple of years to figure that out. And I think that's probably the biggest biggest uh, potential obstacle for people coming into the system, just being real with where you're at at that time. It might take you two or three years, might take you four years even, but being being honest with yourself and trust the people around you of their opinions as well because if you if you have too much expectation on yourself it just builds pressure and the more pressure keeps building 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 you, you, you're not actually growing as a, as a player so i think the best thing i can say to a younger self is just just um listen to a lot more people around you at that time i was more oh, this is my way so i'm going to do it just listen to people there and, and just embrace the journey because it's going to have so many ups and downs and for the first part of my career it had a lot of that yeah, just, I was gonna, yeah. One thing about your first game that's, that stood out, um, you were not part, you didn't get suspended, but you copped a tackle that someone, I think someone copped two weeks for Chance it. Bateman. Yeah. Yeah. Ragdolled. <laughs> yeah, he, he, cli- right. he clipped me. He clipped me with his elbow. Yeah. So was yeah. that like, oh shit, like this is your first game and you're just already getting into it? Like, uh, so yes, it. yes. I think just, I think that, well, that definitely no, I got clipped, clipped on the chin. I was like, who was that? Oh, no, Chance Bateman, just stand back. Uh, damn, damn one. No, so Chance Bateman later returned to West Coast Eagles as a coach. Oh, right. Yeah. Did you speak, yes, to, did you yes. speak to him about Ch- it? Changa, yep, yep. I, uh, I spoke to him a couple of times. He doesn't rem- remember too much. So that's, <laughs> he obviously thought highly of himself as a player. He was like, who is this bloke? But um, he, he got me good and, and he deserved his whack two weeks. He should have got four. Dirty player, Changa. So, um, kind of just hearing you speak about your mindset, I think I think you've always. Sometimes it can be negative, you know, not my way or the highway, but you've been you've been strong willed throughout your career, um, and I think mostly positive. Like, so you've spoken about, I guess, the negative of growing as a young player, but when you start to establish yourself as you did, um, that strong willed probably was your success. The reason why you're able to drive yourself to you know be as fit as you are and, and get yourself to contest. But I, I remembered as you were speaking about this is early days, right, Dan? Two thousand. I could have been two thousand ten, two thousand eleven. I used to be able to kick out. They used to let me kick out, right? <laughs> so they used to give Scully Actually the ball. Possessions. Used to give Scully the ball and um, let me kick out. And we're playing the Dockers in a derby, and um, wasn't going too well. And uh, we're at Frio peppering the scoreboard, and they kick a point. Scully gets the ball, <laughs> kicks it straight down. Frio Dockers. It could have been, might have been Michael Johnson. It could have been Hayden Ballantyne for all I know. Kicked it straight to a Fremantle player. Anyway, he plays on. Snaps, misses. Like, whew, thank God. <laughs> get, I get the ball out of the bag again, right? All right, here we go again. I go, okay, I'm, I'm gonna try and I'm gonna try and go for one again. Bang, free metal docker straight down his chest again. <laughs> so as he's going for, the, he's gone back for a set shot this time. And Shep, a very young Brad Shepherd, first or second year, um, playing in the midfield, probably has come down to me, who <laughs> I'm fourth fifth player, and just said, "Mate, I'll be kicking out next time." So he, go, <laughs> he goes back, kicks her behind. And Shep goes to get the ball. And I, it was a moment I always remember because I was like, Shep went and got the ball. And I was like, give me the fucking ball. Like, oh, <laughs> I'm an older player here. Who the fuck are you? Get out of it. And to Shep's credit, he, he, he let me kick out again. Um, I went, played on, kicked long down the line, Freo Mantle, bang, smacked it down, Freo, <laughs> handball around, kicked it straight over my head for a goal. And I remember Shep just running back to the centre of the bounce, just looking at me. No, no, <laughs> said nothing. That's good. Just like nothing, nothing above oh. it. Do you remember that? Uh, do you remember? No, nah, too many concussions ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I do remember I, I, I do remember that moment. Yes, yes, I do. Yeah, so I always thought, oh, you know, larger in life as, as a youngster, you've got no worries in the world. So just go away, mate, just, just chug the footy here. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take it from here. Mind you, I probably wouldn't have done much better. Oh, I boy. actually never got the license to kick in, even after my 12, 12 years, never kicked in. You can see the guys kicking out. It's, it's, it's Hearn, Witherden, Gov always put his hand up to kick in. Those those three. 
And they were the only three yeah, players. You know that, what um, Shep was doing? Shep was trying to get the first little nice little mark. Oh yeah, absolutely. He used to lead the league in marks, Brad. Until Shep, and that was, until that was <laughs> kicking out. You know, you just play out of the square. You don't you don't have to yeah, kick yeah. it to yourself. You just run out and even kick that short one. And you're interested. I oh, was it very very. Interested. It's probably a good time <laughs> to touch on. So you play 216 games in your career. Cut short. You have to retire concussion, but we will touch on that later. 216 games, just the 19 goals, Shep. Yep. Uh, played played quite a bit of time as a forward. And you just oh, you just scraped, only, only a couple of games. Just scraped out scraped out <laughs> nineteen goals. Yeah. That's not a lot of goals, mate. At yes, all. yes. Uh, well, when I was playing for it, I was I played with a pretty formidable forward line. There was Mark Lacroix at his prime, uh, Josh, <laughs> Josh Kennedy there, Coxie was spending a lot of time forward. Quinton Lynch would have been hanging Lynch out. Lynch there. Stage. What were so you doing? I don't think Brad Shepard as a target going inside <laughs> 450 was high priority for yeah, I mean, the, the halfback is streaming. So yourself streaming out of the back line. You would have been a you would have been a crumbing cr- crumbing type high. high I was, rate I, was a, I was a fat side half forward that, that used to patrol the fat side of the ground, and my my role was just defend and cover off defensively. You know, don't even think think about getting the footy. Don't even look at the footy. Just try and cover space. So I used to, <laughs> I used to get judged on kilometres run a game and the running patterns, as opposed to as opposed to getting the footy. And I used to knock up some huge kilometres and get about six, seven touches. And as a pat on the back, well, well played today. <laughs> Great job, Sheppy. Great do you, job. Do you remember the last goal you kicked? Uh yes, it would have been late in the year, uh, yeah. two thousand and twenty, I reckon. Yep. Yeah. Uh, do you remember which round? I know it. I'm just testing it. Sheffield, no. Hawthorne? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he knows. He's, yeah. he's trying to pretend like he's thinking about yeah, it, but he knew straight off the bat. Yeah, round 12 against the Hawks. And then I think there's one round 11 as well. There, yeah, there was. That's what I was going to ask you. So you, hadn't kicked, you hadn't kicked a goal since 2017. You kicked 19 goals in your career, so there's two yeah. right so there. So 2017 yes. was the last time you kicked the goal. Then in 2020, you go two in two rounds. Yep. What was... Well, I think what? as as my role in the side grew, you know, I was probably playing a lot, a lot deeper than... Initially, I was in the first part of my career, and I, I'd have those matchups. And generally speaking, they, they play pretty close to the goal. That day, the first one I kicked was against Eddie Betts in 2020. He was um, he was playing <laughs> pretty he was playing yeah. pretty deep, and he wasn't getting a, wasn't getting a touch that day. And he kept creeping up, creeping up. And I just knew that you know if I if I get hold of him long enough, he's going to end up going to sort out 450. So I just like just do your hard work now, and you'll. You know, the old saying, you'll, you'll get your liquor at the ice cream. Just just keep keep doing what you're doing. Yes. And uh, funnily enough, he went inside our Ford 50 and got a quick kick out. And um, there I was. I, 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 got, I, I, had, to, I had to wrestle three on, blokes, but I, I, know, the, the, I, I, was, I can't believe it wasn't goal of the year, to be honest with you. I had three blokes hanging off me and it was a snap from 45. Do you want to talk us through the other 18, mate? <laughs> <laughs> as, a, just, as a backman, you, you almost remember every goal. Yeah, I just right. remember, because the, the, well, not the remember, I watched the video today. Round 11, that goal um, against Carlton, everyone got around you like it was your first goal. Ever like it was, there was absolute scenes after you kicked that goal, so it was a big deal. But I, <laughs> I didn't see any video of the round twelve one. I don't know if it wasn't that spectacular, but um, it was no, been a long, it was long just time between um, drinks, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think it's the stock standard. Yeah, uh, goal tackle, but uh, <laughs> exactly about <laughs> every uh, goal. So, so I the one thing I did know because it, it was getting played throughout the media for a couple of weeks that I, I my odds came in for the Coleman after that second goal. <laughs> no. <laughs> Odds came. You entered the actual oh, I think round, I, I entered round the race twelve. For the Coleman, after two <laughs> goals, they thought you were sneaking up the ground from full back. I think you were two hundred and thirty second in the in the Coleman. At that He's point. Two. jumped one hundred and thirty two spots in the Coleman. There you wow. go. Well done, mate. I'll, I'll probably credit where credit's due. It's, it's a good little sat there. Sat there yeah. uh, I'll so, be using that one. So <laughs> yeah, well done, Charlie. Um, uh, jokes aside, again, so. You, you do play some time as a high half forward under under Woosher, probably. Is it fair to say that Simo coming to the club, um, not turn your career around, but new direction for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, at that stage of my career, uh, I was I was getting thrown around a fair bit. I think my best footy was always behind the ball, but when Mark Lacroix went down up forward, when Mark Nikoski went down up forward, and I wasn't getting a game in the back line because we had such a strong back line, I, I thought my... Uh, I was never going to get play AFL footy because like, there's no way I'm going to dislodge uh, Will Schofield or Bo Waters, like Darren Glass, Shannon Hand. Like my role in the in the team, there, there isn't a role. So I put my hand up as a as a young, <laughs> young impatient player. I put my hand up, say I, I want to I want to put my craft. I want to learn the forward craft, and I want to play forward. 
to Wush's, I guess, a little bit of dismay at the time because he he wanted me as as a backman, but he wanted to, wanted me to do my apprenticeship in the waffle, and I wanted to play AFL. That I managed to play for, and yeah, it was a it was a, a difficult time for myself because not naturally a forward. I played forward in my junior footy, but I was a centre forward. I was I was the target as opposed to running patterns, and I found it hard with form, confidence. Um, yeah, battling a few injuries at the time, and you sort of leave yourself like, where where do I fit in the whole scheme of things? Um, but then, yeah, then Wush, Wush left and Simo came in, and one of Simo's first conversations he had with myself was, I see you as a backman, you, you're training with the back line this preseason, and if you do the work, I'll, I'll play you round one. And um, that was probably the confidence and belief I needed at that time, and I felt like I had a really strong preseason, and come round one and I didn't get selected round one. No, really? Yeah, Jamie Bennell got selected over me. Really? Yeah, so that was probably another another thing for myself. I think in you either go two ways. You either you, you get the you, you sulk and you say, Oh no, this is crap, why me? Oh, I should be playing or you just do something about it and oh, luckily luckily for that time I had um a good attitude and went down the to the waffle and had a really strong game at half back, playing against Peel, your mob, down at Rushton. <laughs> And, um, Usually a good day down at Peel. Yeah, yeah, it was that day actually. <laughs> and, um, and then pretty much since round two, never looked back. Just um, yeah, playing at half. Initially it was a half back line, and then as as a you know sort of got more Simo and the coaching group got more confidence in myself. We had Sam Butler playing as that lockdown defender. Once he sort of moved on, that was, that was I guess my role. What's the biggest difference? And this is going to sound like a, a, a dumb question, but like you're playing in the back line, and then you're like, well, I'll put my hand up and try to go forward. Like, what's the the biggest difference or the biggest adjustment? Obviously, you're trying to kick goals instead of stopping them. But, like, as a – I don't know, the f- football – like, what are you having to do that's so different that's like, oh, man, it's a big adjustment? I think uh, as a forward, you've got to make the play. You've got, you got to see the play unfolding and you've got to anticipate where where the foot is going earlier to get a split on your opponent. And it's, it's not easy, especially if, if the ball movement isn't moving freely. It, it's hard for a forward. You, you gotta, you're you relying on the people up the field, your teammates up the field to, to I guess, kick it to you and kick it well. Because if they if miss kick, you might do all the work in the world, but, you know, it goes unrewarded. So I found it hard because you might be getting split or whatever reason and you're not getting the footy. You're like, yeah, I found that difficult. But then behind the footy, you, you get yourself in a good position and whether you're defending one-on-one or if you find yourself in a good position, you can almost read where the footy's going to go and um, you can always watch the opposition kicker's eyes and you're always in a position to impact. And then you got, I feel like you got, the reason why I love being a back and you get two chances to impact the play. You get in the contest itself, but then uh, to try and turn it over, but then you get a chance to, when, when you win the footy back, if you're smart with your running patterns, you can get a look on the way out. So it's a good double play to sort of impact the contest and game. So um, you move solidly into the back line. 2015, we end up playing in a grand final. So that year is the uh, is the Weagles web. So we've spoken <laughs> to a few boys about that. We had Sharon Wellingham on the podcast. We had Sam Butler on the podcast. Uh, Tommy Barras, no, he wasn't involved in that. But uh, you played a really important part that year um, in developing that way of defending. And you probably were more of a higher intercepting player than you probably moved towards the back end of your career. Very similar to me, actually. Just had you up the ground running and carrying, and then as you get older, you just move sl- slowly back to the <laughs> yep. back. Uh, how do you reflect on 2015? You, you play you play in the final series, player of the finals, playing a grand final, lose. How, how's 2015 as a whole reflecting on that? Yeah, that was, a, that was a really special year for the whole footy club. That was a, that was a year where... Talk about adversity. Uh, we were building as a group, but as a group, we, we hadn't really done any, anything for a while. And then it's in the preseason, Mitch Brown, McKenzie go down. So it was a bit of bit of caution in the wind. I think uh, Adrian Hickmont was the, the defensive coach at the time, and you were there, Sco. It was just the way we from where we started the year. It was like I think round one or two, the way we defended. You know, we sort of knew that it probably wasn't going to work if we kept defending like that. And then it just kept growing week to week about. Whether it, is, whether it is because we had a lot of guys playing down there, played not traditionally backmen, a lot of guys played forward and so the way they see the, the footy as opposed to Dow defenders, like they're attacking defenders. And uh, we just, it was all about reading the cues of the game and just reading the cues off each other and just trusting each other. So we never actually had an opponent behind the footy. And it, I, f- I felt like 
It was, it was a great way to play because, you know, you, you, if a four kicks a goal, it's not on you, it's on the back six. Yeah. So it felt like you could even be even more aggressive, aggressive with your uh, positioning because, you know, there's no real consequence. And I felt like the scoring chains were getting off because we used to intercept the footy a lot by playing that way. The, the offence and scoring yeah, uh, chains we got off the back of that was was huge and no side especially playing at Subi on a, a narrower oval where it was easier to guard space we just felt like we were ahead of the competition in that stage and to be a part of that to be able to play on on guys that are 170 centimetres small and then in the same about five minutes later you're standing next to Nick Rewalt who's you know 198 but it doesn't matter who you are in the back line you, you, know, you just get the job done and we always relied on each other to help out in the air or on the ground so it was a great way to to play and um, really exciting time for the footy club because that was the first time where I think as a playing group you you could sense the real momentum if you really commit to a cause and really want to get better and and um, you know play with some flair and natural instinct then you can go anywhere and we sort of did that albeit got found out on the the final final stage final leg yeah. of that season but to even to get to the grand final um, was pretty special and to be part of that 2015 grand final week, missed 18, but to say that I, you know, I did the grand final parade and um, got to play on the biggest stage was something that was pretty special. Before we um get to the more of the actual game day of 2015, with the I know like the players that we've had on and even you, Scott, you don't really like to refer to the Weagles Web thing. Like I just a, call it that because it's a bit of a media. That's, that's what people know. It was about. a bit. Yeah, yeah Jared, it was like a, Jared Healy coined it. That I think. yeah, it was like a thing that came out in the media. But how much of that was purely just like, was it just all developed in pre-season and then the coaches come to the defenders and go, okay, this is what we're doing? Or, like, do you have, like, meetings and then, like, you pitch in, like, I think we should be trying a bit more of this? Like, how does that even work, oh, that defensive scheme? I'll give you a little bit. Like, <clears throat> it was my most enjoyable year of footy by far because, um, yeah, pretty much like Shep said, the, the first couple of weeks we just got toweled up and we're defending back shoulder and we're getting pulled apart because we lost our two key defenders. So it was like, well, we either do that or we start being aggressive. And look, if we still get toweled up, at least we're taking it to the opposition. So that, how that year, like every year is different, but how that year came apart, uh, came together was we'd sit down and, and, and pick apart every game and uh, can you be more aggressive? Can you can you help your teammate more? It, it wasn't about can you beat Nick Raywalt? Can you stop him kicking goals? It was about... How can I help Brad Shepard? How can Brad Shepard drop off his man to get an interceptor ball in front of me or press up to your man or, you know, just – it was all about everyone else, Yep, I don't think. Absolutely. And an, a great person to be in that role was Adrian Hickmott. So he, he was a great facilitator at that time because he empowered the players. So the players actually drove the meetings about where we feel we should be standing. And he was – he had his uh, opinions where where he thought as well. But it will always come to a middle ground. And if it was a middle ground, it would always be on the players' side. Because yeah. we're the ones out there. We could feel what was happening. And he, spoke, he spoke a lot about footy gods, Adrian Hickmott. He always thought yeah. that if you did the right thing and you put yourself in the right positions, the footy gods would actually look after everything else. There's, there's, there's the footy yep. gods. Yeah, put yourself in the right spot and that ball bounces in front of you. If you're in the right spot, it's going to bounce the right way. Right. And there's no There's no – there's no rules said fast. You don't have to do this in that position or do that in that position. Just put yourself in the best spot. Footy gods will look and up. And he, he was big about the attacking side as defenders in terms of if you can get two hands to a footy, mark it. Like, I, don't, I don't want to say spoils. If you can mark it, you mark it. If you, if you, you fumble a ground ball, instead of being, you're being harsh on you as a player, be like, oh, why'd you fumble? You, but you, that's, your, that's, your, that's your one for the game. Good. A, I've seen you. You take the next nine clean. So you sort of... If he made a mistake whilst he was a, a line coach, he, he knew that you'd never be, he would never worry about it, and it, and it gave you peace as a player to even go for things that you probably wouldn't normally go to because you had the license to to be attacking, have that attacking positive mindset. Yeah, that's a good point. A lot so of confidence he, in the playing group. So Hickmont was sort of the like. He's now at Hawthorne under Sam yes. Mitchell. So he's was he sort of the like creator of the Weagles web? No, it's it's player player driven. Yeah, um, right. But but, but uh, you need a strong invigilator to be able to do what Shep's talking about, which yeah. is provide that confidence for players to drive that. Otherwise, if the coach doesn't lead and the players don't have the confidence, then it's just a wish wash, and who knows what anyone's doing. But he was really big on you guys are going to drive this and I'm going to back you in whatever you do, but that the pressure's on you then. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. we, we knew mm. that that was on us. If it didn't work, it was on us. Mm. But if yep. it did work, it was on us too. 
Mm. I'd love to know like some schemes that like coaches have come up with in the preseason that have just flopped horribly. Like, <laughs> wow. to push everyone forward <laughs> for like the first five minutes. No one in the in the backfield. Like I don't know, just things like that where like they watch film. And they're like, this is a this is a genius scheme. Like if we do this, we will win. Who do you think of any? Oh, I'm trying to think of any throughout. Sure. Uh, we 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 because so what happened with that year? We did that for that year, and and it worked so well. But then you, you need to keep getting better, right? If you yep. just do the same thing forever, people figure it out. So I remember the the year after we tried to we tried to start adding some rules in, so we could be taught to younger players. Right, it, it was a lot of intuition. It was a lot of feel, understanding what Shep. I knew what Shep was going to do, so I stood on this yep. side of my man. You can't transfer. You can't. That. You can't teach that. So we try to put some rules in place, and the, the whole system blew up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm just thinking of like, say, like the Golden State Warriors in the NBA. They like, I thought, let's get rid of the center. We'll put a guy who's like six seven at center, and we'll play everyone small, shoot lots of threes, and then it just changed. the So game. That, they did that. And they did that, yeah. and it, like they won a bunch of championships. I mean, too. the one, the ones that do, they do it and it doesn't work that you don't remember them because yeah, they exactly. usually win yeah. spoons mm. and yeah. you don't understand it. Yeah. Um, all right. So 2015. What's that grand final? What, what do you remember about the actual grand final day? Oh, that's a, you played well. Yeah, the grand final day. It's, oh, this. I just really wanted to enjoy the experience. So getting up there early pre-game and. And really taking in the surroundings, there was a, the grand final sprint for memory going on. Just being part of the, being being there and being present of what's going on, as opposed to, because I'm quite an anxious player pre-game. I used to get quite anxious until the warm-up starts. And then once the warm-up started, I was fine. So I just wanted to try and put myself at ease as much as I can by just being there and present with what's going on pre-game. But um, the game itself, what, what I can remember is, we, we had our moments, like, as... as Bad as it's saying, yeah, we got beaten by like 40, 50 points and the first quarter wasn't that great scoreboard, but I felt like we were in the game for long periods of time and it could have gone, there was moments there within the game if, if we made the most of those opportunities and I still reckon it could have been a different result because it felt like Hawthorne were tiring in that third quarter. But um, yeah, it was a great experience and to be able to 100,000 people one, one thing, but in, I think it was the second quarter where Hodgie kicked that uh, goal from the boundary, left, left footer. Yeah, don't look at me, mate. I was, oh, I was right, well, I was right well, there. Yeah, I was, I, I was like, was you, you still have a right ankle from, I, that, from that. I rolled my ankle. You know the shooting stars, mate? Where, <laughs> da, 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 yeah. I'd be still sliding into the abyss, <laughs> mate. No, that, 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 was a, that was a memory because I, I wasn't far from I was standing behind and just that roar of the, the Hawthorne crowd, everyone to their feet, that was, that was a moment that I'll never forget. It was a moment where I wish I could forget, but yeah. to be there in that moment, it was it was actually pretty special to watch. Big goal, big stage, and just that, the atmosphere that the, the the G presents itself in a big game. But yeah, there, there weren't too many celebrations post that for us, but we had, a, like I said, I think takeaway moments within the game where we let ourselves down. I actually thought throughout the majority of the game, we held ourselves in good stead and just the damn wall broke, unfortunately, then. I reckon Shep might be the first person we've spoken to this, you know, in a year when we when we've brought up 2015. That's been like has some slight, not positive, but you know, not all like some, some people that we've had on. It's like want to completely forget 2015, but it's probably the most positive I've heard someone talk about it. Yeah, and it's real though. Like Shep's reflections are real. Mm. It's just I guess just different perceptions of. Yep. You know, how, how you look at a game and how you think about it and what you do want to remember. But, like, exactly what Shep's saying is correct. Yep. It's just some people don't want to remember it and some yep. do. And, yeah. Um, so 15 happens, we do that. 16 and 17 you build and we, we go to 18. You have a great season, play every year, every game that year. Um, and, I mean, I think I – think, I think, I mean, the discussion we're about to have, it's pretty um, – it comes up with me a lot. I'm sure it comes up with you a lot. Um, 2018 qualifying final. My, my year for 2018 was a bit of a rough one. Uh, I lost my best mate at the start of that year. Had my had my first child, Nash. Um, and I and and I'm in the team last round of the year. I think we think we go to the flag together. Get a call from Simo on the Thursday and think he's ringing for my match up. And um, <laughs> and, he, and he tells me we're, we're going with someone younger. So he was, he was telling me he was going with TB, basically. Instead, it was out of man TB to play that game. Uh, the which, first which game is this? Collingwood so, qualifying final. Yep. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I was I couldn't have reacted worse. I reacted worse than losing mates, losing my dad, um, injuries, anything. That was the worst I've reacted to anything in my whole life. Um, sh- shocking state, really. And 
you know, on, on the other end of it, I get to the I, – I pretty much was in bed for like two days, just a shit state, and I thought, I thought to myself – the only way I get back in the team is if I get up and wake up and get my shit together and support the boys. There's nothing I can do. I've been dropped out of the team. Supporting the guys is, you know, I don't get to play in a grand final if they lose. And, you know, so supporting. So I, I remember getting to the game being very supportive. I was, like, overly supportive. I was just like, I just, I just can't – I hope you boys win. Like, because it was the only way I would be, get back in the team. And I don't know. You can take it from there, basically. But – you know, it, that, that, that game doesn't go how you want it to go. You play every game and yeah. no injuries. Yep. And then yeah, no in. injuries. No, I think, uh, as you would have felt, well, I think 2018, there was a period there, I think at the start of the year, I think we won 11 or 12 in a row or something, but that was the purest footy. And that, that was that was when, you, as a player, you realised, you know, we're actually a pretty good side. You know, this year it could be, yeah, this could be a great year because I've never been on a footy field, even though we made the grand final 2015, I've never been on the footy field where almost having complete dominance of sides that you highly respect in the at the top like at the top end of the ladder, and we're just dismantling them with our ball movement and just the way we're we're playing. And each week we screwed confidence. Jack Darling was in; he was the best form I've ever seen a forward play for the first half of the year. And then, uh, yeah, then also towards the back end, leading into the final series, you sort of you had that sense of you know this is this is our moment. You only get it a few times in your career as a playing group. And I think all supporters feel as well. Yeah, you know, this is this this is the year to to go all the way. And um, yeah, it's that first final. Uh, you know, I, I think I played ninety six games straight to that point. Soft tissue injury or any injury was probably at the back of my mind. Never thought it, would, it was going to happen to me. And uh, just that moment with the game where I, you know, talking about the stats, I chose to bloody soccer the ball as opposed to probably picking it up, which led to. Uh, tearing my tendon in the hamstring when, and tearing all the, the muscles around it, which was disappointing because at the time I thought, um, is that a cramp? And I was looking up the scoreboard, it was like 18 minutes into the first quarter, I was like, can't be a cramp. So I tried to get to my, my feet and I could realise a sharp sting pain straight away. And uh, coming to the bench, I could feel I was getting worse. I was like, no, this, this is not great. And what Scoey said, um, it was great to see Scoey in the rooms post that incident because he came down pretty much just before quarter time to come and console me to see how I was. And um, at that stage, our club doctor, uh, he said, you know, luckily for you, it's a, it's a low-grade hamstring and you're only out for two weeks potentially. And if we make the grand final, you'll be there. So It was, it was you, your dad, me and the doc in the room. So I came down, the other boys were upstairs. Again, I wasn't down there to be like, oh, yeah, I hope, hope Shep's injured. I'll get back in the team. I was literally my mate's injured. Like, I yeah, it was right. really, really positive. You never know really how positive. long someone's going to be out for. Yeah, and, like, you know. and do you remember? You, you were doing yeah. tests, and they were, they were testing your hammy, and you, you had some strength in it. And yep. I'd done some hammies before, Shep, another day, another day hammy. And I was like, mate, I genuinely thought, I was like, mate, you'll be right. Boys will win this. A couple of weeks off, you're playing in granny. Like, you'll be fine. Mm. I feel bad about it now, but I was, it was, I was just trying to be – yeah, Positive no, I, actually, I really, really yeah. love that you came down to, because like saying that someone who's had ham, ham, hamstring injury, injuries in the past and to be able to have that bloke just to lean on to be like, you know, it's, if, you, if you do the rehab, you'll be right for two weeks, albeit he's, he's the next one in line. So I was sort of, there was part of me as well with knowing I was going to be out if, if, the, um, if the guys were to get up that game. Uh, seeing Scoey there as well gave me a level of... Uh, confidence but okay like at least we've got someone ready to come in who's, who's stiff to go out in the first place um it's sort of element element of myself of uh you know i have a let the boys down not being being there on the field tonight if they lose the game you know because this, this is before that the sub rule medis rule i think for memory so i was like mm. so i was like have, have i just cost this playing group the club a chance to go deep into the final so i was probably more emotional about letting everyone down as opposed to the the injury itself and yeah that whole night you know i was on that game ready it was like an ice machine ice pressure machine pretty much had like an hour of sleep because i did it every every i think uh 40 minutes for the entirety of the night till i got a um, scan the next day which showed that it was a tendon tear and it's a 12 week injury and you, you're going into uh, surgery in three days so just how quickly things just changed overnight was was um yeah it was pretty difficult and like Scully said I had to. Well, I really want to be upbeat and positive with everyone because if you if you get seen 
uh, being down and you're, you're disappointed and uh, talking about earlier about being the victim and why me, it can, it can be infectious and r- rub off on people in different ways. So I didn't want to be that person. So I, I needed a couple of days to, to debrief and, and get some clear thoughts of you know, what it all looks like and what, what's next. And the first thing that came to mind was as soon as the surgery had been done was how can I get around the boys? Because at that stage, they'll, they'll lead into a prelim. So how can I just just be there and just just you know be still part of the journey, but knowing that you're not going to be playing? So you find out the tendon, you know clearly you don't know the club's going to go and win the grand final. But like you said, there was a feeling around the group that we were one of the best teams, if not the best team. So there was confidence. Do you is the is the reaction? Um, what what is it? What 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 do you what do you feel when you get told tendon's gone? Yeah, I was uh, I was pretty pretty emotional. I was, um, yeah, I was just at the cafe um, and get get the phone call, thinking it was going to be good news, and it was straight away. It, it's not good news. So straight away, I was like, oh no, this is this is not great. And uh, immediate thought was, yeah, this, this is the the that moment, that opportunity that you worked hard for. It's going to be taken away because oh, I never had that feeling in my, the first eight or nine years of playing AFL football. This is this is the moment in time where I think we're going to go all the way, or go at least close to it, give it a crack because the way we're playing, had so much confidence, and um, everyone was just playing at their A level. Everyone was playing to their potential at that stage of the year. So I was, yeah, I was pretty pretty upset with not being there. But that was I tried to hide it as much as I can internally. So as soon as I sort of stepped outside my house, you know, positive vibes always be that sort of. Not upbeat, cause you can't you can't force yourself to be upbeat, but just be just be normal and just accept what's going on and, and sort of show that, you know, there's more to life than just football. Um it's not irony is the wrong word, but basically Shep and I had the same feeling, I think. We've spoken a fair bit about yeah. it. Like so I, I felt like Shep felt when he did his hammy the week before. Like I felt like my opportunity was gone. You know, I'd put my life work into this career of footy and, and I and I wasn't gonna get the opportunity back. And, and now someone gets injured and it's Shep and I do get the opportunity, but at that moment, that's how I was thinking. So we've actually been through pretty similar mm. emotions, right? Um, okay, so win the prelim, coming in the great week, we're playing in the grand final. Um, how's that week for you? Yeah, that was, I think, it, that was that was the toughest week of my life. The, uh, the, the week leading up to the grand final, not just the missing football itself, but... Uh, one of my close mates and my sister's partner uh, passed away first thing um, Monday morning, and that was um, oh, I was in shock. I was just yeah, didn't expect that to be happening then and there, and had that sort of numb feeling, and went spend the week over in Sydney, which I was sort of away from the whole the football uh, hysteria which which Perth has because it's such a passionate footy state. So I was sort of away away from the group a fair bit, and. Um, yeah, to spending time with it, with the family and with, with my sister, and you know, just just reinforce that you know, as as bad as it is for me, like in a selfish point of view, not being out in the footy field, there there is so much more to life than just football. It's it's a game. I love playing it. It's great that I can play the game, but going through this experience just shows you that you know, you, you got to be you know, is, is this more life? So at, at that sort of in terms. I was more I was more struggling with with that than being at the ground watching watching everyone do what they did, mm. and um, uh, I remember the Friday night get get I flew down to to Melbourne on the Friday afternoon and saw the guys quickly and um, didn't want to disrupt their run so I kept it hush hush. No one knew at the time about what was going on because quite a few of the teammates were, were mates with him as well and we knew him very well. So I sort of didn't want to lob lob onto them what was going through because you know talking about distractions could have been a potential distraction for a couple of players so um being that upbeat and being, being positive and was was i guess hard to do but it was something that you know i sort of if i if i said to myself i'm going down there don't don't be down don't go down to melbourne with the playing group and and uh be loping around if you're going down there you, you're there to support and and really err the boys on cheer the boys on and um yeah there was moments throughout the game and pre-game where I was you know, away, it was just, you know, it's quite emotional and dawned on me what was going on and, um, yeah, sort of led to that first quarter where I think they kicked the first three or four that 
I just I think the the emotion and everything just just got hold of me. Where it's just, um, yeah, not I don't know if it's a panic attack thing, but I just started sweating and started hyperventilating. So I was I just need to get out of this position in the stands because I was just it was just everything was just overwhelming. I think it all finally caught up. It took twenty minutes into the first quarter and maybe they are four goals down. <laughs> West Coast are four goals down. So I was like, oh no, this is this is not how it it, it planned out and sort of that feeling again of me not being there like have I contributed to, to this in any way so I, was, I think the emotions got the better of me so you were sitting with with other team members and what did you have to just have a spell and yeah so they um yeah there's, there's no glamorous seats for the, the squad <laughs> we, we were up in the nosebleeds <laughs> no <laughs> you know I think one of the first tiers pretty good seats actually just in front of the Collingwood uh players race where they run out and saw the flag Dismantle pre-game So that was actually Great to see But um, <laughs> yeah. yeah Just uh, in one of the, f- the Front rows there D- Did you Game day for you It might sound like A weird question But <clears throat> I've, I've spoken to other guys That missed out on You know Grand finals Or premierships Or both Or whatever What was the f- Is it dumb to ask Did you want the boys to win Like Did you Does that Is that a stupid yeah. question No not at all oh, Yeah um, Yeah absolutely 100% yeah. I think like as soon as you you understand that, yeah, it's the eighteen to twenty two. Obviously, it's going to mean a lot more. But just the, the the squad itself, what they've got to go to to get up for every game, and you need training standards high. You need the support staff, what it means to them, the the coaches, how much work each coach puts in after hours. It's not just you know rocking up from eight to five. It's it's yeah. after hours, and they all the supporters. I think. Footy clubs, it's 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 more than just eighteen. It just it means so much to so many different people, and even just being retired now, going down to a pub watching the game, just how much passion and how much footy means to everyone. So you know, I, I was I was a, I was more of a supporter and fan because I just wanted everyone to win. Because I knew if we won, this like how good the state's going to be, how good the, the club's going to be, the feeling inside the club, how good how good WA's going to be. You know, so I was I was just more of a fanboy that day. So five minutes to go, um, game goes how it goes, boys get themselves back in the game. You're up there with Gaffy, yeah. Nick, Gaffy and Nick, Nat. I've seen the footage. Yeah. You boys pacing around. Pacing around. I was pacing around. <laughs> what's, what, I mean, what's that? What's I that? don't think I've seen that. So you're out of your seats and you just... <clears throat> yeah, so... Because Gaffy, Gaffy's out with an eight-week yep. ban from, um, you know, the Brayshaw incident. Um, Nick Nat's missed with a with a knee. Yep. Um, and you blokes are... You're like out the back. It's like the yeah. Zoo. So Nick, I think Nick was on the bench. He, he had to be That's front. Right, he had yeah. to be front center because he, he was a, he was a Rux coach that year. Rux coach. The back. Yeah, Rux coach. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, it's in just, very commas. Just to justify that big pay <laughs> that he gets from week to week. Yeah, they had to give him a role. No, he, he did a great job that year. Yes. Um, but yeah, Gaffy and I just uh, as we're getting close, you know, you're, you're sitting down and you're, 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 good, you're, you're very good mates. With, yeah, yeah, I'm, potentially I'm, best mates. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, cl- oh, yeah. One of your best mates. One, one of the better close, better mates. Don't have the best mates, Scully. Yeah, bit of a bit of a loser, you know. Good. Perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> he's Sorry, mate. Juggle. You're, not, you're, not like, like, you're not a loser, mate. It's meant to be a serious moment, chap. Um, Five minutes ago. Yeah, because I think like as the game's getting close, you know, being stuck to your seat, you. Shoulder to shoulder, like you can't like you can't move. So, um, quite a, quite nervous. I saw Gaffy get up straight away and go and stand at the back of the, the seats at the block. So I was like, it's a good opportunity to go and stand back there. Eric McKenzie was there as well, and we we're just pacing up and down because you know it, it's it's nerve wracking. It's a grand final. It, it's a couple of points in it. Um, so <laughs> that that play, the, the famous McGovern play, the moment, the the moment. I actually didn't see it live. Oh, I was head down, pacing up and down. I only saw it when Boy. Sheed marked it. Really? Yeah. Because I, like, I couldn't actually watch. Because it's harder to watch because it's, as a player, not it, in the moment, it, yeah. it's out of your control. So yeah. I reckon you're nervous watching when you're playing. Yeah, there's no, no, no nerves at all as a player. You're just worried about setting up or yep. speaking to your team. Like, you're not even thinking about the result, really. Yep. And and one thing I found, even watching now, just like certain things guys do on the footy field, the running patterns or the contest or – how they their skill it, it, it's a, from the stands like how, how do they do that <laughs> how has he just done that but when you're out there it just it's amazing like watching watching it live from the stands like that's that's just amazing play like that how'd that bloke just do that but when you're out there it just shows you just how much you're just in tune with the game and so focused on just the next moment you can be involved in you ever do that, that you, when you're watching yourself like you're sure you watch your highlights you've 
Uh, with those 19 goals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, how, that's how I know play by play exactly yeah. what happened. And what right. I repeat at home on the TV. <laughs> so Sheeta kicks the goal. Um, last minute. Goes how it goes. What's the feeling when the siren goes? Oh, it was just elation. Yeah, everyone was everyone was up and about. Yeah, I was I was hugging I was hugging everybody in my sight because it was a, a very uh, favourable West Coast contingent up in that grandstand. So everyone knew everyone and everyone's just carrying on. But straight away it turned to how do we get on the oval? <laughs> everyone, there was a there was a moment where some, I think oh I can't remember who said it. But get down the stairs. Get down. We have got two minutes if you want to go on the oval. So it's gone from, gone from yes, yes to get down, and I was, I was still trying to get over my hamstring, so I was like hopping down the stairs. Were you on crutches or you just? Uh, at that stage, no, just right. just got rid of the just crutches. Limping around. Yeah, I was limping around. So I was hopping down this like three flights of stairs, trying to get to the bottom <laughs> level. Everyone, everyone was running ahead of me. I'm like hopping. Because <laughs> the last thing I wanted to do is, is tear my hamstring up the <laughs> surgery after the week, yeah. and um, and then managed managed to squeeze on up the race and get on the oval and just to just to be there and experience. That moment, you know, as, as a player, it'd be completely different. But as a spectator, and um, yeah, I guess mates with everyone, to be able to share that experience uh, straight after the siren was, was something pretty special. And everyone, all the West Coast fans, hung around all game for, for the first probably two or three hours post game to be able to to be able to witness it and do the do the lap of honour with everyone. Um, see Sheeta have his personalised photographer standing behind him, <laughs> taking taking what? photos of everything. Oh, um, but it was a great moment. This, I mean, this question might be loaded. I don't know. Do you, do you, do you, pe- people ask all me all the time, I, you know, um, do you feel sorry for Brad Shepard? And like, so, so I'm your direct play, replacement, right? I find this interview quite, it's not strange, yeah, it's, but it's like, it's, it's direct, yeah, right? No, it's interesting to watch. So I'm your direct replacement. People ask me all the time, do you feel sorry for Brad Shepard? My answer is no, I don't, uh, because that's how footy goes. Right? My, my, my footy journey was what it was, and yours is what it is. And uh, do you, do you harbor, Jealousy, uh, jealousy, maybe, or, or you know, I wish I was there. I mean, you've, you've got an incredibly refreshing, positive um, outlook on life, really. But th- that whole twenty eighteen, h- how do you feel about not our relationship, but you know, the fact that I come in, play a grand final, win a premiership, and you don't? Mm. Oh, I think in terms of the the uh, relationship, like it's great. I'm, so I'm really happy that you got to experience that, and it's great that you know I thought you were stiff to go out in the, in the first instance, so. You know, talk about journeys and stories that just shows you that, you know, if, you, you, if you're out, don't drop your bottom lip. You, you could be back in straight away. So I think it's a good lesson for everyone. But, yes, I, they, don't don't get me wrong. There's, there's still moments I think, um, oh, I wish I was a premiership player. I wish I could could have played. That's why you play team sport and sport in general. is just it's not for a paycheck. It's to be able to test yourself against the best and to win premierships. And that's your sole existence. Well, it should be your sole existence to why you play sport. And to miss out on that it was tough, but um, getting back to that game, I think is in the change rooms where all the playing group had left and everyone had left um, and went up on the oval because you, I think, I'm oh, not the killers. I get to go get presented on stage and Jets was singing the midnight oil, or midnight something. oil, yeah. or some, some not meatloaf that was a couple of years before. <laughs> um, but I, I had a moment there where I was just you know, you know I was yeah quite emotional. I was like you know this is. It sucks. It sucks for me. And uh, Daniel Pratt came up and he goes, you know, don't let this moment define you as a person or a footballer. And that's all he said. And that's all he had to say. And, you know, from that moment going forward, just as I've been been happy and content with it. Being all, all the, all, although, yeah, I'd love to be a premiership player, but straight away from that moment, um, a, a good saying that the old man always drilled into me growing up was like, your, your character is always... Is never tested when things are going well. It's how you deal with it, deal with adversity. So I reckon I had about a week where I was, yeah, a bit flat with with what was going on. But straight away it turned into motivation. But you know what? This is this is what it is. How can I use this as like motivation? How can I come back a better player and have have a really good couple of years? This um this question I feel like comes up a lot. Like just in in general, footy fandom. Um, Thoughts on every player getting premiership medal, like because you you know you're one step away from getting that. Every or squad not. member, every you know, even just the forty whatever, the forty four list or whatever. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I've always been the past no, been uh been like this should just be the twenty two, but going through what I have this year, 
of more recent, I think the concussion the concussion protocols are going to be even more relevant and be uh, going forward. I think players potentially will be missing a month of footy. I think through, I just think that's the way it will go. Whether it's not not next year or it could be, I can should be next year, but going forward and. If you think if you played all year and you miss a month of footy or you miss the first final, and I think potentially if you play say fifteen games in a season or you play games, then you should be uh, presented with a medal. Because I think going forward, I think it, it, in the past, I should say, with if you do get injured, that's just part part and parcel of the sport. But the because concussion is so topical and you want to protect the players itself, you know, it'd be it'd be um, I think as a player. If you knew that you're doing the right thing for your health, mm. knowing that if the team does go all the way and win a f- win a flag and you're still going to get it presented with a medal, then I think players will be more open m- more open with the doctors about what's going on as opposed to hiding everything because we all know if you start hiding things, then the more long term effects that these players have. So oh. does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Does. Uh, do assistant coaches get uh, assistant coaches do. I th- yeah, no, maybe maybe not. I mean, I, I'm kind of the same as Shep. I often think about if roles were reversed, right? So because th- before Shep gets injured, roles are reversed and, and I miss yes. out on the flag and I miss out on the – you know, and I think Shep has handled it and speaks better than I ever could and I'm pretty proud to hear him speak about it, to be really honest. Um, but I would – I've always said no. Like um, I think it should be only the 22 that get it. And that wasn't based on, you know, I've won one, I, you know, no one else deserves it. It was based on if roles were reversed and I didn't play, I don't think I would have wanted one uh, uh, for some reason. But the same as Shep, post-career, I've kind of, I've kind of come full circle and been like, no, nah, it's, it's, it's like what Shep spoke about. It's, it's, not, it's not the 22, which is what I thought it was. It's, it's the 40. It's, they, they, it might not be the 45. You know, some guys don't play in a year. Right, but they they do have something to do with it. But maybe it is the guys that play fifteen games in a year and get an yeah. or twenty two games in a year and get an injury or a head knock or something like that. There there put some sort of there is some place. provision for guys that have clearly the only way that team's got to where they've got to is because they've done what they've done. Mm. So I, I've probably revised so my position around. as well. Yeah, you're, you're pro. Yeah, we both have both have yeah. putting some sort of filter in place where if you played X amount of games yeah. and I and I never have been, but. Probably I've always been that. The last six months or so, probably just, you know, wiser. Every, almost <laughs> every other sport does yeah. it. No, it would make sense. Um, all right, 2018, done, done. Anything else? Done. So 2019, 2020, um, I mean, y- you do take that that uh, fail, you know, uh, missing out on something and you put that to good use. You go uh, 20... 19. 2019 All Australian squad, 2020 All Australian selected. Um, you play um, State of Origin for your state in a bushfire relief match. You win a Glen Denning medal in 2019. You win Best Clubman in 2020. Like you, f- you fired that for your rest of your career. That that was your fire, right? Mm. To to win another. And the, you and Gaff Gaff did the same. Nananui did the same. Guys that missed use use that. Is that right? Yep. Use that to drive yourself. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the motivation was was never high because we saw it as you know, a, as the squad we had, how close we are to potentially go back to back or at least put ourselves in contention again. So, yeah, you know, I think is yeah between us three, but you know, even the other guys that had an experience, it was it was real resolve and motivation to to try and get back there. And the guys that had won one. That were close with you for me, instant. You know, I used to write. I don't know. You know, even know this. I used to write Shep on my wristband in 2019. You know no, that? no. I used to write Shep on my wristband. Um, sometimes other. I used to write stuff on my wristband all the time. So 2018, it was um, AFM, who's um, my mate that I lost, Andy MacArthur, and my dad's AJS, right? And that was kind of my my. Um, it was to help me switch on mentally. And so through 2019, I had Shep on my thing. I, I was playing with you. And I used to write Shep just as a bit of a driver to, um, you know, want to get back there for Shep, for other people. And, yeah, I think, like, we'll be connected forever with this shit, right? Mm. Like, it's definitely something I get asked about all the time. And it's a good thing. I mean, I know it's not positive in your end. And for some aspects, it's not positive for me. But 
it is how life and footy goes sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. You have your ups and downs. Yep. And, um, you know, that, that stage was an up for me, but you've had more ups. I know all Australians are scoey. <laughs> what, right what was the process of that um, all Australian selection happening? So, you know, where's your blazer at the moment? Well, that's my thing. I still, still don't have a blazer. What? Hey, we spoke to Josh Kennedy. He said he only get he's a multiple all Australian. You only yeah. get one blazer, which I was shocked at. Yeah, so I still haven't received mine from 2020. Why? Did they not fly? Is it COVID? COVID, yeah. So they didn't fly. So Hang on a f- absolute second. Yeah, Back to cha- Charlie. Get your blazer. Charlie, start writing the email <laughs> right now. Yeah, yeah. AFL, AFL now. at this AFL. Is ridiculous. That is not good enough, mate. I'm telling you right now. You don't have your blazer. Negative. And, and that's not something you'd chase up either. Chef wouldn't be yeah. like, where's my blazer? We yeah, need to handle this. Okay. Would you like it handled? Uh, that'd be size? great, yes. What's your blazer size? Your 42? <laughs> oh, I've probably blown out. 48? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go have a couple. All right. You know what we're going to do? We're going to get Shabby's blazer. That, that is the actual directive out yep. of this podcast. We get your, your fucking blazer. And I'm going to present it to you <laughs> right here. All right. Sounds great, mate. I'm actually excited. Awesome. This is actually that All right. Cool. Great. Yeah, that's our mission. And all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to segue this straight into the things that people deserve. You obviously did lap of honour around Optus. What was that like? Uh, it, it was great, Sweaty. albeit being Sweaty. like 35 degrees and wearing a light grey blazer. Yeah, I was there. I watched it. You, I, you, <laughs> you, you know, you I were, saw it. I, saw, <laughs> I did. As you, as you came past, I was like, oh, boy. Just, just people on. listening and watching along. I've, ne- I've never seen a sweat. I've seen footballers. I've, yep. I've seen athletes. I've never seen someone sweat so much in my life than Brad Shepard on the back of the highlights. Yep, it was steaming. And I'm a big sweater. <laughs> and and, and I, was, I was going along with it and going past the bench. And I was given to the top tier, like right up. Yep. And then some lady came up to me. Uh, I forgot her name. She was working at the club. She goes, just let you know you got big sweat, sweat patches. <laughs> And, I, and I've, I've gone straight away. I've gone like the T Rex, oh, no. the T Rex waves. So I'd mates in like top tier, and I was like trying to like got that like T Rex, yeah, the whole time. And then, <laughs> then the, the the amount of criticism I got post, but mate, you gave us nothing. We we got there early to see you, and you gave us a little half half wave. And I was like, well, there's a reason why, because from my armpits to my waist, there were it was drenched. Yeah. Are you are you a naturally sweaty yeah. guy? Yeah. Ever tried like the dry claw, those sorts of things? Is that a drink or something? Or? No, dry claw is like a, a deodorant that you spray oh. on and it like literally blocks your pores. <laughs> it's like a wetsuit. <laughs> yeah. You just wear That's a wetsuit. Have you ever tried that? Wear right, a wetsuit. So next know. time, next time okay. you go to the store, dry claw. All right. It's a thing. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Good no, to know. The reason why I was asked as well, because Scoey hasn't had his lap. Haven't you? So you haven't had your blazer? Scoey had. Yeah. Yes. Like, we're no getting lap. Your blazer. 2020. We're getting yes. a lap because there's players who have retired that have got a lap. Yeah, so who's the, who's the point of contact with that? I'm, I'm, I was going hoping to ask you actually, Brad. Okay, well, well leave, leave me with it. <laughs> okay. Chris Maston and Lewis Jett are also waiting, mate. Yeah, so right. I reckon we have you three of you in the back of a Cadillac. Cadillac? Roof, roof, no, t- Toyota Highlight. No, yeah. Audi. Audi? No. Yes, Audi is the sponsor, uh, so it's yeah, sorry. Audi convertible. Um, Make sure you wear a black blazer, if you do wear a blazer. Uh, now, it's been a good chat, mate. We're getting into social media shortly, which I know you know all about. One of the great segments One of the of greats. Time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, let's let's talk about the end of your career, mate. Because yep. um, you know, I, I, you know, done too soon. Concussions. Um, yeah. You know, when were the incidents? Like, and and what? How do you reflect on them now? And then where are we at with it all? Yeah. So the, the incidents uh, was going over the last twelve months. I had a numerous amount throughout the career, but last twelve months um, had a couple in training, just just head knocks, uh, nothing really severe. And um, then the, the Fremantle game in the preseason, that's when I ran into Bailey Banfield's knee and that, that uh, cut me open pretty good. The old Harry Potter scar there, that's there for life. But you're gonna, <laughs> you're you, you would have some yeah. ointment or something to put on it. The ointment. <laughs> is that the word? Ointment? You used to, I mean, <laughs> before is we, I mean, this is a very serious situation. Yeah, but, uh, but before we get too serious, you used <laughs> to come in regularly with your nose busted up and your lips busted up. You, yeah. you, used, to, you used to get head knocks quite a lot. I, yeah. if, I, if I think back over my career, and it was funny yeah. at the time because Shepard come in, his, his nose is busted up, and <laughs> got a fat, big fat lip. Or so you, you you put yourself in harm's harm's way as a player. Yeah, and I obviously now to my detriment. Yeah, um, yeah I think the the way I always played my footy and I always grew up was you know you, you got to play hard, and if you don't go in hard or you put yourself in a position, especially as a backman, if you second guess yourself, I feel that's when you do get hurt the most. And you know whether, whether it's uh, they were clumsy or the way I played a bit chaotic at times if 
if you're trying to halve a contest and you're out of position, you, you do anything to scrap and trying to bring the footy to the ground, uh, whether that's just running into someone flat out or standing under a high ball. I feel like it's a bit more so as a backman, you sort of have that uh, the, the instincts and competitive instincts to to not fail, not fail and just never get beaten or you have that mindset never get beaten if you have that then you'll get the best out of yourself and that's what i always had and um, unfortunately yeah put myself in harm's way one too many times and yeah, it led to to me having to finish up a little bit earlier than what I expected what was the what was the the feeling sort of wait or what is it now for you what was it week to week when it was at its worst or is it still bad like what, how, yeah how so it? um so my last one was against uh against Fremantle. So that was the last derby, which is not a great memory, getting beaten by Freo. Mm. But um, yeah, it was quite an innocuous knock. It wasn't wasn't a big knock itself. It shows you that like, the the repetitive nature and the accumulation of head knocks throughout even the last twelve months had caught up with me. And it was it was a delayed concussion itself throughout the game. And it wasn't until the the day after and weeks after where it really started to affect me, like my day to day living you know severe headaches uh getting severe head spins just getting up off the couch getting out of bed even walking around the block after after two weeks of having this last one i was um you know having severe head spins and you know really area of concern where being a being always been um a positive person just having really bad mood swings fluctuations just out of no reason and you know it was enough to combination with that and the um the head spins which led me to um, yeah, get, getting a scan of my head, which showed all these micro hemorrhages, which is like brain bleeds, uh, which was, which was re- oh, at the time, well, still is pretty confronting. And that led me to really exhaust what was going on with upstairs to, to figure out if footy is actually still, still a, a viable option for myself to keep playing or if I can keep playing, what, what does it look like? And through all the testing over, I think it was about three months, um, yeah, the conclusion was to, you know, footy was deemed too high risk for me to keep playing. And um, that's, I think, at the time, yes, it, it was hard to hard to swallow. But at three months post that game, I was still having like, symptoms and bad symptoms. So um, I tried to get back into training about a month later, before uh, even before I made a decision with the Waffle guys. And, um, you know, about an hour post that last training session, I felt good and I was ready to go on the off season, enjoy the off season. I um, uh, like driving home, the lights startling me. Uh, couldn't read my phone light to be able to call my partner and say you know, something's not right. Head spins, and I was just in a like a world of just I've never experienced before. And that's when I knew like this is this is bigger than what we all expected. I ex- I expected, which sort of confirmed all the findings that I had found out over the last over that month prior and then the, the month post that as well. And um, yeah, as tough, it is, tough as it is, it's, it's real. It's, 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 um, it's, I feel like it's coming, becoming more common in AFL players and in all contact sports around the world. The further study and with head knocks and the, uh, the accumulative effects of sub-concussive knocks, it's not so much the, the big concussion, it's the accumulation of just that feeling, don't you get dazed in a game, you get, you get knocked and you're like, oh, 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 knocked, got knocked and you're, you're saying stars for a bit, but you're still conscious, you're still with it, you're still past you're the not, testing, you're, yeah. like, you're not knocked out. Yeah. So accumulation of that over a five-year period, if you have uh, ones week on week on week, then that has the, the lasting effect, long, long-term long effects. Do you worry about long-term effects? Yeah. yeah. Not only your mental health, but your, your yep. health? Yeah, absolutely. It's sort of... Oh, seeing all these past players coming out now, um, you know, speaking up of experiences they're going through, it's um, yeah, it's, I do get a bit worried. It's not not so much to now. Um, you'd like this? I've got a, a pair of optical glasses or reading glasses that are, are ro- tinted rose coloured, so they're the <laughs> rose coloured lens. It's uh, it's not a fashion accessory. Or <laughs> Shep used to roll into team meetings with glasses from very early on, two thousand ten, two thousand eleven. Like reading, like, yeah, yeah, like the ones you got on. Okay, yeah. and, and we used to we used to bag him and say you're just making this up. But you're telling me now that you're ro- you're rolling around with rose, yes, yeah. rosies, yeah, got rosies. Well, Mick Moldhouse yeah. transition lenses on, yeah, <laughs> pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, but that's so uh, that helps to um, to read. So to be able to concentrate o- over, so like regulate, over ten minutes, regulate your eyes, yeah, to yeah, your right. brain, put your your brain at ease. 
because if I read for if I didn't have them or wear them whilst reading, and even off computer screens, it's um yeah, it's about a ten minute span before you just your patience you, you just gets too overwhelming. So that's that's definitely fast tracked my um, development in terms of getting over these symptoms by getting these glasses. So if you see me rolling around with these <laughs> rose give colours, some oh, feedback. give us some advice. But there's yeah. there's an underlying thing why I'm wearing them. Because you you um did you sign another contract in twenty in the off season of twenty twenty one or was that midway midway through twenty twenty one? So you two hundred twenty extension, yeah. yeah. So you were like you know there was no at that point you'd obviously had some knocks and it was just you, you still thought your future was well and truly yeah absolutely yeah. And well yep. so I don't think you ever think of it as, as a play you just you you go you go based on how based on how you're feeling. Then and there, at the present, you can't you can't forecast what the um the future future holds. Yeah. As a player, you can't not expect to be in contest. You can't not expect to to get hit in certain stages of the game because it's a com- competitive game. It's a contact game. Um, but it wasn't till yeah that the back end of last year where you know the the, the sub concussion knocks knocks. It was taking a bit longer to get over. And I was having blood tests. I was having all these test to see what like, I, I thought I was deficient in iron or I, was, I thought something was going on but never actually thought it was my head until I had that bad one against Adam Saad who blokes half my size knocked me out knock, knocked me for six in the middle of the SEG yeah. but um, it wasn't until that last Fremantle game where it sort of post that going through the testing all everything started making sense like why I was feeling the way I was why certain things were, were the way they were two more questions um one on the back of you retiring early from concussion, and in fact you've had head knocks. Do you do you look at the game and think rules should be changed? Uh, should or, or do you look at it and accept that it's a competitive game and a, a, a contact sport, and knocks are going to happen? Where, yeah, where yeah. You sit on that? I, I I think the fabric of footy is constantly changing, so I don't want any change. I think as a viewer, viewer, you don't want any anything changed. I think what needs to change is I think the protocols and probably greater awareness of players if they about the concussion and about the symptoms and I think if we better educate the players the players will be more open to that feeling and I think that's going to help them and protect them in the long run but I don't see rule changes especially for head, head knocks okay good last question now this is a this is this is a personal one I need to go on the <laughs> chest oh well so I was quite publicly um scathing a little bit before you retired it was released in the media before you actually got to speak to the players, did you did you know about that? Did it affect you? Um, just inter- I, I I sort of have spoken to you, but I'm interested to hear what you, what you thought about I that. Forgot that, that even happened. That oh, was I shit. Did. Yeah, um, let's, let's yeah, yeah good question. Yeah, um, sorry, yeah. Yes, yes, I was, I was still waiting on a, a final report to um, you know from the neurologist to to dictate the outcome, but it was it was pretty emphatic that you know I was going to be finishing up and. The hardest thing for me was uh, the the younger players always come back two weeks before the older group, and I wanted to make sure everyone was in town to be able to to tell them. And there's only a few players that knew at that stage, and I understand footy clubs people talking. You know, it was pretty much out there, but I, I sort of didn't want it to be out there until I had spoken to the playing group because the last thing I wanted was, you know, I just wanted to, from the horse's mouth essentially like, you know, this is these not getting into the reasons, but this this is why you know a big more of a thank you to the players and the footy club. So, yeah, I wasn't overly wrapped when it got leaked, the story. Yeah. <laughs> and thanks for going into to bat for me. <laughs> well, I mean, it was it was a thing for me that, uh, well, I probably knew because of my personal relationship, but I knew you were retiring. And, but I think a lot of other media types knew you were retiring. And, you know, a lot of people put to me, which is fair enough, that, you know, you've, people are in position, they've got to report the news as they find it, which is, which is fair enough. But I, I felt like that specific case... Um, you deserve exactly what you just said, the opportunity to speak to your own teammates. You played a lot of footy with, spent a lot of your life with. You, you deserve the chance to tell them. So I was disappointed for you. So you don't need to say that. <laughs> oh, we we did a whole – we did a podcast episode. Yeah, I, was pissed, little, I think I was on really YouTube purely about I was, I was pissed off. Yeah. Now, look, right, right, <laughs> no, that's enough about shit. Okay, well, it's not. Social media. Here we go. Social media, the greatest podcasting segment of all time. Sheppy, you've done well to get through the questions from Dan and I. Well <laughs> – here are the questions from the fans. Here are the hard ones. Um, I mean, we'll start with this one. This is from M. Lacra, number two. M. Lacra. Yeah, M. So Lacra two. It's M. It's, yeah, it's M. The oh, letter M. M. Okay. Mark. Oh, here we are. Yep. So apparently M. Lacra one was already taken, so he went with two. 
Oh, also yeah. his number. Yeah. Rename it Napchat after <laughs> this guest. <laughs> yeah, you anything to say? I'll give you a, well, you last rep- run of play. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, Lekka, as we all know, is, is uh, having this glamorous holiday with a, with a caravan all around Australia, going to some exotic places, yeah. fishing. And, but for him to jump on that page and to to have that comment shows you that the trip's probably not going as well as w- what he would have liked. <laughs> He's getting a bit bored. And for him to, to have a pot at me from afar, I say... No, I thought I'd say, mate, I appreciate it because it just makes me happy that he's, he's hanging on to this. Very good. I well, assume well just like I love my, Mark Lacroix, Eagles fan all my life <laughs> and, you know, big fan. But I just assume whenever I think of Mark Lacroix, whatever he's doing, he's just in a West Coast Guernsey with a premiership medal on going, you know what happened next. Like, <laughs> he's just <laughs> always in that state. He, he is the ultimate pest, Lekka. <laughs> yeah, he is number one pest. Uh, Thomas Diamond. Uh, which three players from the club do you see yourself still having a beer with at the pub at the age of 60? The age of 60? Oh. Be lucky. Yeah. I'll be, be lucky, lucky to get 60. <laughs> um, at the age of 60, oh, it'd be, it'd be hard to say. Three, I would hope, I would hope most of them. Most of the guys have played uh, over 100 games, I reckon. We've got that real relationship with, so it's hard to put a number on just three. Do you I remember know. how many games you played with Scoey? I'd be 100. How, take a guess. I reckon his whole career. Or just about 100. Nah. I mean, 180. Went oh, high. Overs, absolute overs. 129. Oh. All right, well, guess the. Uh, <laughs> so 129. Give us a percentage of win win rate. Okay, so it must mean more than. Uh, I'd say. 45. Percent. So. We, 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 50. We, we won some. I games thought maybe together, early, 55%, early. Percent. No, no, no. 55. Yeah, 55 percent. That's all right. 55%, yeah. Well, it's 70, not 10% difference. No, 70, not. 70, yeah, but you've given wins. us a lose. You started with a losing. Yeah, you well, went, you went, I went overs the first. Yeah, sorry. 72 wins, 56 losses, one draw. Draw. Gold Coast, mate? It wasn't bad. Gold Coast. Adam Scott, 18. Um, so I thought he'd be playing. Be out, there, <laughs> out the greens, wouldn't he? <laughs> Adam Scott. Uh, true or false? You were the worst player for the Atterdale Bombers three, Pete. Should there be a royal commission into how, into how you won the three? Adam, yes, I know yeah, Adam, Adam well. Yes, uh, uh, he was at a rival junior footy club, and uh, the Adelaide Bombers, the mighty three Pete. We had a lot of Aquinas boarders to play for that team, and um, fair to say they were very handy players. And um, luckily, luckily for them, they they chose Adelaide as the destination club. They they wanted to win flags, and um, yeah, I, I definitely wasn't the best player of my team, and won multiple flags for them. Royal Commission upcoming by the a, sounds. A, a, as you can see, Adam's um, still pretty salty with those <laughs> results back in the day. We're talking <laughs> seventeen years ago. <laughs> was um, was it was it someone that said that Brad Shepherd's dad still wears a bombers, um, bomber jacket? Yeah, what a surprise me. He was the head coach. Um, Which club? Actually, here's one: Added old bombers. So uh, Jeff Marsh was uh, assistant coach as well, and one of the years we had Chris Connolly whilst he was coaching Fremantle. He was one of the assistant coaches. Well, there's the reason. There you go. There's the reason. Chris Connolly, Charlie, you happy with that Actually, or what? I think he got a bit distracted. I'll tell you didn't what, he? what a big Freo fan. Big Freo man. <laughs> yeah, I am. Well, one of the uh, best things to see was when Chris was distract. coaching. <laughs> he would he would he was coaching free mail outside and they weren't doing that well, but he'd come down to every training session on the Sundays, uh, help coach us and Afterwards, always have a barbecue, and he'd always be the one on the um, tongs cooking the barbie. A bit more time spent on the dockers, <laughs> yeah. Game yeah. But I will say, what, what a man! Well, what a man yeah, to be able to like, be able to give back to the community. I played for the Coolbinia Bombers, which is you know where? Sh- yeah, Coolbinia. <laughs> yeah. Need a passport to get there. Oh, yeah. Chef, the Chef, 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 Chef doesn't spend a lot of time out of the Golden Triangle maze. <laughs> spends a lot of time around <laughs> the rich areas. Uh, this is just a this is just a one one word answer. Marshy dot Omira. Uh, who is the better fisherman, Shep or Lekker? Shep. Ty underscore taker three. Having to defend some of the best comp in 1v1s, how did you prepare mentally? Best in the comp. You've, you've read that incorrectly. <laughs> some of the best in best the comp. Best players in the comp. How did you, you prepare mentally to play on is some this, of these guys? This is not one word? This is, this is multiple words? Or? No, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, give us, yeah. How, how did you used to prepare against playing on some of the... Best forwards. Uh, so I always used to do a lot of um, homework with whoever my line line coach was and watch a lot of vision and um, always used to get get it towards the back end of the week. And then um, if I could incorporate it to main training, I'd always practice on, like, visualise how I'd play that particular opponent. You, you reckon you've got to go, especially those roles, you've got to go into detail. 
to see what's their strengths and how even as little as how they what side they roll. So you know, lead up what side they roll. If you if you watch a Ford, always has a preferred side. So if you can, what do you mean by that by roll? Just for uh, so when a, when a Ford leads up and doesn't get used, how they roll back to to uh, create length in their game to be able to be in a position to to be in the contest again. And he always used to find if I could be in be in the way and sort of push them out of the way, delay them by two or three seconds. Then they're two or three seconds out of position from being at the next contest. So I always big believer. Yes, you've got to be a good defender and you've got to defend the contest, but playing these forwards, I used to prioritise when the footy was away so they would be out of position. So when the footy came down, they weren't in a position to impact or be in the contest. So it's always like the pre-defensive work. I used did, to really nail them. Did you, did you find that forwards have, would have, you know, like a bit Zoolander-y and only turn left? Like would guys have this? They I'll go tell the you what, way? that's funny. Jaden Stevenson. Really? Yeah, Jaden Stevenson. I remember this. I remember this. I remember this. Yeah, so... Um, it, it, and uh, Fritch does it a bit as well. He like the way he his leading patterns. But Jaden Stevenson, he was one player, and I think it was eighteen where he was having that good year. And we went over to the MCG, and he was playing out of the goal square, got pace. He's like uh, Daniel Daniel Pratt was like, you know, he's he's your matchup, you know. And he he went into detail in like such detail. He goes, he only <laughs> he only turns. I think it was left for memory. Only like top, only. I was like, no, he, he does. He goes, I swear. Only turns left wherever he goes, he'll spin left. I, I watched a fair bit of vision on him. I was like, he actually only turns left. So I, I was defending him like, <laughs> like please tell was, me he turned right. <laughs> no, not not once. So I was I'd always like always get and, and pressure him, and so he couldn't turn left at all. So he would run, try and run wide around to try and get him behind me. By that stage, the footy's already come in. So I found that that's, that was a way to to beat my Exposed. opponents, try and expose. Look any any weakness they have. Uh, bro, um, Se- Sevenson's built like a young Brad Shepherd uh, back in the day. <laughs> Very similar builds, actually. Um, Prowls.com.au. I um, feel like you know this person. Brad, how does it feel to be known as the cousin of Mitch Marsh and he's better at footy? <laughs> well, it's, it, it's pretty good now. He's, he's, had, he's had a pretty good couple of years, Mitch. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> no, he's, um, and is he better at footy? No, nah, he, he, he was a man child as a, as a youngster. So he used to plonk himself at full forward. Traditional Tony Lockett, or yeah, probably Tony Lockett. Um, I actually reckon he would have got drafted, but the the way the demands on the each individual, you got to be able to run. You know, he would have found it a little bit tough, but it's very good hands. The bison, the bison got a got a massive head That's on him. <laughs> yeah, oh, literally massive scon. <laughs> <laughs> we we'll keep it going, Alex. Double underscore Paul. Uh, how much faster can you bowl than Mitch? No, nah, he was always quicker than myself. Okay. Uh, I was a more swing bowler. Yep. Okay. What about the second one from the underscore J underscore Jaden? What made you change your <laughs> Guernsey from number 12 to number five? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, what made it was number five was a, a, my junior number. Brad Ebert just left at the time. And I'd played two years at number 12. And um, I felt like, you know, I was, I was having a rough couple of years wasn't getting a kick. I was out of the side. My second year, I think I was emergency 14 times for that. And I was like, you know, I was just sick of number 12, to be honest with you. And also, Scully would know, at Subiaco Oval, the locker positions. Number 12 was stuck in, in the corner and I had no seating room in front of my locker. <laughs> so they'd built the locker room. It was, it was, a, it was a rectangle. Yep. And they, they had 12 and 13 effectively opening into each other. So you couldn't sit in front of your locker. Yeah, like, exactly. Who exactly was 13 that. at the time? Uh, Shui, oh, yeah, Shui, Shui. Shui and it was 11 Pritter and then there was me in the, like stuck in the corner with you have no, to go to sit by yourself so, so, so yeah so <laughs> look, looking, looking back now like yeah. open the change but at the time just little things like that were, were big things that talk about the mindset of the plaza I'm not having number 12 like I haven't got a kick in it I'm stuck in the corner my junior, junior number's number 5 I had to go to the club I had to go through a process reasons why I wanted number 5 and they, they luckily ticked it off how quickly, so Ebert leaves, are you, is, you see a text, Ebert's off, oh, okay. Within an hour. I got a goal. <laughs> yeah. well, I was, I was you front foot. It? Yeah, I was front foot, yeah. Good. I went straight I love in. you. I love yeah, that. This is, that's, that summarises Brad Shepard's career. <laughs> Five <laughs> comes up, available, time to go. Yep. <laughs> that's it, Cheppy. Awesome. Loved it. Is it good? Yeah, thanks for having us on. Nah, I appreciate you coming on. Some direct questions. Been wanting to do this for a long time and it was good fun, mate. Absolutely. There we go. Brad Shepard done and dusted. 
been fun, Dan. Backchatpodcast.com.au. You can find us there on socials, backchat double underscore Brad. You like that one, don't you? <laughs> um, thanks to all of our supporters and sponsors, Whippersnapper Whiskey, uh, Margaret River Roasting Co., Blue Bet, Cameo, Shelter. Oh, might crack a shelter after this, actually. Definitely. Beautiful beer down in Busso. Um, you can email us at hello at backchatpodcast.com.au. Reddit's not getting a gig anymore. I'll tell you that right now. And have a look at the best, worst Guernseys. Best going worst Guernseys player worn one of those on the line for the best worst one in the competition. That's it. Bye bye.